Um, my name is John Keeley. Um, I'm a member of the Supply Chain Council. It's a not-for-profit organisation um, I'm a volunteer for, so it's one of these sort of organisations that I give up lots of my time for nothing um, to try and help and promote supply chain on the, uh, on the global stage. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today is, um, is, is how to use the SCORE model and the M4SC methodology to support something that I'm a uh, big advocate of, which is value chain segmentation, which is breaking down the organization into customer-centric value chains that align the strategic objectives of the business with the day-to-day -day activities that take place, whether that's in the warehouse or in the sales force, so that we join up and create a more aligned and integrated whole. How many people here actually have heard of the Supply Chain Council? Four. Okay, that's not bad. I'll include you as well. I'll make up to five. Okay. Supply Chain Council is a global not-for-profit organization. Um, it's been an organization since 1996. Um, as of last week, actually, there was an announcement that's now going to merge with APEX, if you're aware of the APEX organization, so they're going to come in together. Um, and it was created um, to try and create some sort of standard in the industry. Um, because when we talk about supply chain in different organizations, that means different things. When we talk about different metrics and different processes, every organization created their own, they named them their own. And even now when I go in and work with organizations and I say, you know, talk to me about your supply chain, and they'll say, oh, we, got, we have a complete end-to-end -end supply chain. And I go, okay, good. Talk to me about your end-to-end -end supply chain. Everything from procurement all the way up to manufacturing. Are you okay? What about commercial? What about sales? What about... And in some organizations, supply chain is a sub department of procurement, you know, so it reports into procurement. In some areas it reports into manufacturing. And it's, it's different things in different businesses. And what Supply Chain Council has tried to do is to try to create a global standard. It's an open standard that people can actually go to. And businesses, therefore, don't spend huge amounts of time deciding what they're going to name a process, decide how to measure a process. You know, this is available and, it, and it's done for you, which hopefully speeds things up. To enable that, um, we've created something called the SCORE, Supply Chain Operations Reference Business Model. Again, that's been around since 1996. It's now on its 11th full revision. It contains things like SCORE risk, SCORE people, green score, so it's got carbon reduction metrics and things like that in there. All the processes and metrics that help you do that. And it's continually evolving. So as we get more members, as we move into more industries, you know, it doesn't quite work for us in this particular industry, so the model evolves. You know, we're now on the 11th revision. That's a lot of revisions in, you know, 15, 16 years, really. So think of any medical sort of dictionary or anything. It doesn't have that kind of revision. So it's constantly evolving as the industry evolves. And what... Supply Chain Council does a lot of is training, training and education. The whole purpose of it is to try and grow supply chain as a global practice, to grow the level of knowledge in industry so that people actually start to talk the same language. You can talk the same language with your suppliers as you talk in your own businesses. So we talk in school about source, make, deliver, return, plan, these sort of standard terms that start to mean the same things within different parts of the business. So when you start to break that down, you and your suppliers can talk the same language so we can understand the same things. Okay, so purpose of, the, I don't know why I'm looking up there because it's in Turkish, I really need to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Purpose of Supply Chain Council, it's, you know, it's to increase the level of knowledge really globally. That's what it exists for, like I said, it's a not-for-profit organisation, so it's there, it's an open standard to try and, you know, generate, a, you know, a consistent level of knowledge across the world. Do this by providing three things, uh, frameworks, benchmarking, there's a score march, be score mark benchmarking service which allows you to measure yourselves across all the different score processes with other companies. That's free service for members, so some consultancies will charge you, you know, a quarter of a million pounds to do a benchmarking process. You know, we, we kind of provide it for free as long as you're a member of the council. Professional development, training programs, certification working um, with practitioners, we have the SCORE P certification, which you have to go through levels of training and then an examination. And also SCORE S, the scholar program that's been done with universities. So we're working very closely with a lot of universities to, to bring in the next generation of talent, to actually get people at the university level talking supply chain, understanding supply chain, not just understanding operations and manufacturing and logistics, but actually thinking end to end. 
Supply Chain Council is a truly global organisation. Um, it was born out of the US. Um, it's then moved quickly into Europe. The Nordic countries, strangely, are massive adopters of it. Um, some of the big companies in there, Ericsson's, Volvo, really you know, took it on heart. China is a massive growth area at the moment. Um, the emerging nations, as you would imagine, you know, hey, this is free knowledge. We'll have some of that, please. Thank you very much. It's sort of grabbing and gravitating towards this. And, and I find this really interesting because I'm from the United Kingdom. Um, I try very hard to use this, We've got to promote this in the United Kingdom. And there's a level of arrogance, I think, from the emerging, from the, sorry, the mature markets like the UK that think, hey, we, we kind of know this stuff. We don't, we don't need to know all of that. So they, they don't turn up. I'm at the SAPIX conference in South Africa later this month. There's a thousand people going to that event. I get five in the UK. You know, this is the difference of people who, who say, look, we want to learn. And, and the Supply Chain Council has the, the knowledge and the materials to actually share that with these people. So lots of members. There's about a thousand in total. This is probably going to grow with the APIX merge. Um, these are some of the names um, appearing on screen in a very animated style of some of the companies that are members of the Supply Chain Council. SCORE, the Supply Chain Operations Reference Model, it's a framework and it contains four fundamental things and the power is not in their independent components. The power comes from the way they're actually integrated together. And those four things are as follows. We have the ability to help companies do business process re-engineering, so the ability to map their current as-is states but also to map their to-be states and to use the standards in terms of nomenclature, standards in terms of process definition. And that's where the SCORE model comes in. You're then able to identify where your gaps are and where your issues are in your processes, and then you can measure those against other businesses. That's where the benchmarking side comes in. If you want to know how to improve these processes because you've identified they're the weak links in your business, then actually what SCORE does is has all the best practices that actually that would improve that particular process. So you can look to see whether or not you actually use those best practices. So why does this plant have a better you know, capacity utilization rate than that plant over there? We can look at the best practices of each plant maybe and practice it. And that's obviously very good in global businesses. And then talent development, skills, capabilities, that's where the SCORE people guide. So independently, they're all very important. When you actually put them together and you can map your business and actually say, well, in this process here, we are actually measuring this particular level. And when we compare it to our competitors, this is the size of the gap. And when I compare them my people skills that I need, they don't have the skills in order to be world class in demand planning. It's when you actually bring them all together that the real power of SCORE actually comes to fruition. And SCORE is just one of a number of models that Supply Chain Council has developed. So SCORE was the original one, but now we have Decor, Design Chain, Operations Reference Model, uh, Sales and Support, that's the Consumer and Customer Chain, C-Core, and very, very recently the PL Core, so the Product Lifecycle Operations Reference Model. So they combine together and integrate between them to create an sort of end-to-end platform with exactly the same logic, exactly the same nomenclature, so it follows through from everything from consumer all the way through product lifecycle out to supplier. And, and you know, pre-supply chain activities, design activities. So why is SCORE important? Why, why, why do this? Why spend our time doing this? It's because, you know, I've been in this game for 20 years. Um, I've done a lot of work with companies who have um, wanted to implement ERP systems to, you know, as a silver bullet that's going to change the way their business works. It's going to be so much more effective once we get this integrated system. Blah, 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 blah. The problem always is People, at the end of the day, agendas, politics, culture. And if we look at this um, result here from the conference board, a 2010 study, and the top executives in the world were asked, what is the thing that concerns you most? The top three were the ability of the organisation to execute its own strategy. So there's people in an ivory tower who kind of get what we think, we're where we're going, and but people don't know how to get there. So the actual translation of strategy and goals into action is the thing that actually business concerns about. So there's no lack of smarts in this world. People understand strategy, but it doesn't get followed through. And we end up firefighting, and we end up with dysfunctional silos. And how, how does the organization work together better to deliver the results that we want? So these two, specifically, are around the organization's ability to do what it said it wanted to do. 
So if culture is the way we do things around here, then the biggest problem that stops people doing things is the way they do things. And again, um, another study by Cranfield University in the UK and a consultancy group called Solvent Fesso. So what causes the issues? What's our barriers to success? This was specifically for supply chain managers. Number one, company culture. Number two, lack of leadership. These are all people issues. You know, lack of information. These are all things that we solve. None of this is outside the ability of the organisation to control. But it's the things that stop things happening. Would you agree? And a lot of this is actually because people don't know what the strategy is. Yeah. So the, the purpose of the organisation is unclear. And if I don't really know, then I'll do what I did yesterday. And, and, or I'll, I'll wait until someone kicks me and then I'll do what he wants me to do. So this unclear purpose means that actually what we have is a one-size-fits-all business model. So the supply chain, <coughs> here is the entire organisation. We have one set of processes. And that ends up with you know, bureaucratic or misaligned processes and procedures where we just keep bumping into each other. You know. Sales have got volume put targets to hit, and you know, that bangs into the capacity utilization targets the manufacturing bumped into, which bangs into procurement, they're trying to buy cheaply. And they, you, know, you put them all together and we don't get the desired result. There's a complete lack of ownership and accountability across the end-to-end -end supply chain, you know, which means we have multiple misaligned targets and goals. And ultimately, people get frustrated, you know, and there's a lot of lack of trust in the organization. So what you end up with with these people, and these I-shaped people who say, well, I've become very good at my job, be it buying, be it manufacturing, be it sales, because my measures tell me to be very good at my job. But when you start to join up lots of people who are very good at their job independently, and the customer comes along, and customers want different things. Some might want reliable supply, might, some might want quick, some might want low-cost products, and it all gets merged into the organization. And we've got a guy at the top there uh, who's trying to be, you know, link everything together, and the culture is just weighing the arms down. He's just bringing them down. So these different metrics, misaligned directions, they're pulling the business in different ways. And then we do it all again tomorrow. And at the bottom here, we have a finance guy who says, I want you to do all what you're doing, but I want you to do it cheaper. Yeah. So this supply chain misalignment, this constantly changing directives, a lot of organizations, they'll say, well, this month it's you know, increased profit, next month it's increased volume, then it's reduced working capital, then it's the, the, the shift in directives being passed down. A lot of cases to try and increase shareholder value based on short-term goals just creates frustration in the organization. And these goals work against each other. You know, so you create these tension points in your organization. I hope this translates okay. <laughs> the difference in a lot of cases is, in an organization, you know, we have right first time and the cost of doing things right first time. And the business people say, well, you know, this is the cost that I currently have in my organization right now that I'm accountable for. So you're asking me to take on more, you're asking me to manage data, you're taking me to take accountability for something that I'm not measured on. Now, that doesn't sound good, that's just more cost in my department, and because everyone's in their little eye shape. So I've got all this extra effort that you want me to do. Eh, don't see the value in that. The reality is that all the things that they're not measured against are things that actually happen in the organization. So these unproductive meetings, this status chasing, this firefighting, this you know, constant last minute change of the production plans, these, they happen. But they just get wrapped up in the cost of doing business. And no one gets held accountable. And then they look at the bottom line and you go, we're too expensive, cut costs. So I've sat in boardrooms, and in one particular instance I sat with CEO and, and he went round the table and he asked his directors to sort of go through how are they doing this month and everyone went, well, I've hit my numbers, I've hit my numbers, I've hit my numbers. And he got round to him and he said, well, that's fantastic. Apparently everyone's hit their numbers but me. Because everyone's functional metrics were achieved but actually when it added up to the total business, he hadn't hit his numbers because they're misaligned. And this is all hidden. This is all iceberg stuff. It's hidden under the surface. And one of the tasks is to bring it up so we can actually address it, because as long as it's hidden, 
And I always use a line, you know, you cannot control what you do not understand. If you do not understand this, you have no hope to control it. You also cannot improve what you do not control. In a lot of cases, we reward these behaviours. So, hey, you know, at least the firefighting results in more overtime. I get paid more, you know. The heroics, we stick the cape on, we fly in, we solve out the problems. I'm a hero. Meh. Where right first time doesn't sound so good, you know. Doing it right last, in the last minute, that sounds better because, you know, I get rewarded for that. The results of this on employees, however, is, can be devastating. So all this short-term firefighting that takes place in the organisation means people don't really get time to focus. We're always focusing on the short-term, we're always focused on today's issues. Which means, and if you follow psychology, you know, one of the big things we try to do in organisations is to help get people to flow, create a state of the flow where actually we can focus on a task to create a solution that we all agree to. We can't do that if I'm constantly reacting all the time to today's emergencies. Well, if I'm constantly reacting, I never really get any sense of progress. We're just doing this Groundhog Day every day. We're just doing the same things over and over. Trying to, and all we're getting is pressure to do the same things over and over, but cheaper. And it's not a very fulfilling place to work. So people get frustrated and they get disengaged from the organisation. So, you know, these are, I, when I work with companies, I do you know, what analysis and I, I speak to people. You know, I understand what's going on. I create like word clouds. How does working at this organization make you feel? And here's some examples, just of, of three companies I've worked with recently. You know, what's the biggest word that comes out? Frustrated. And frustrated is a good word in some respects because if you've got disillusioned or demotivated, you're kind of fighting against an organization that's kind of given up. Frustrated is, you know, I kind of like working here, but that's so tough. You know, it's just, it's draining, it's exhausting. There must be a better way. And then what we do to make it even worse is we measure everything. Because we don't really know what's important, we'll measure everything. And then we'll just average it. So, on average, everything looks okay, which is a bit like saying, hey, my head's on fire, my feet's in ice water. I'm okay round about here, though. On average, I'm okay. You're going to have to work. I expected a laugh then, okay? <laughs> so we have to think differently. So we need to start creating some clarity. We need to start creating some focus. And we need to start creating some engagement. Okay. So when you clarify the purposes, this needs to be clear to people about what the goals and the purpose of the organization is. More importantly... How can I contribute to that? How do my activities actually contribute? Because if I don't, there's a disconnect between what I do and actually what the organisation is trying to achieve. So when I work with organisations, I say, Look, you know, you might be a warehouse guy, but actually if you understand that we're after, in this particular supply chain, we're after reliability, then you can suddenly con see how you can contribute to the reliable picking by not walking past a bin that should have stock and it hasn't gone stock, by actually understanding that I can contribute here by ensuring data as integrity is there, by picking these issues up. Suddenly, I go from being an unvalued warehouse person to a very valuable member of an integrated end-to-end -end supply chain. So we need to start to get people to understand the purpose. Then we can start to align the systems. And then we can unleash the real capabilities of our talent. And then start to inspire you know, cross-functional trust. Trust the numbers. Start to talk the same language. Understand each other. So in, in the Supply Chain Council, we have this, this um, management for supply chain model, which basically is like a tiered structure. And I'm going to follow this through now, if I may. So we'll start with business strategy. Um, that then breaks that down into the different supply chain strategies, which allows us to understand what our supply chain network should be, which allows us to understand what processes we need, which finally allows us to understand what resources we need. Okay, and we can start to align these and create feedback loops, you know, have we got the right talent? You know, have we got the right processes? Have we got the right network? And you know, as constantly evolve. So let's start with strategy. Problem in businesses a lot of the time now is we're in a, um, a sort of bloody war competition uh, where it's all about trying to grow the slice. So has anyone here read um, Blue Ocean Strategy? No. Okay. We were talking about red oceans and blue oceans. Really, we're competing for a bigger slice of the pie. And supply chain, and this is the problem with supply chain, it's all about how can we drive operational efficiencies so that we make more money out of our slice of the pie. And really what I want people to start to think about is value chains. So rather than competing on price and transactional 
important is value chain and supply for supply chains, real value is being able to deliver better goods and services to customers in a way that they deem of value. And that might be through better customer service, it might be through you know, differential offering, it might be through faster product delivery. There's a whole host of ways that we can improve that. But if we don't understand what they are, then how do we know what to deliver? And when we don't understand, we guess. So some businesses I've started with have got, wow, we need more responsive supply chain, so I'm going to start delivering same-day delivery. And I say, for who? They go, for everyone. That sounds expensive. As you, you know, why? Well, I think that will create us market differentiation. Does your customer want it? We don't know, but we think that if we do this, it's a hugely expensive gamble, but you don't really know. So focus on customer value. Put customer delight at the heart of your business model. And the real, if you talk to any of the strategists, Michael Porter, or any of the new guys on the block, like me, you know, we talk about putting, you know, customer delight at the heart of the value chain. So different supply chains, different businesses compete in different ways. So you may compete on customer intimacy, so your relationships with your customers, which would be like flexibility, your ability to merge your supply chain to their needs. It might be around pure operational excellence. So it might be around low-cost solutions. It might be around the quality of your products or the cost price. Or it might be about product leadership. It might be the ability to deliver very innovative products that actually really understand the customer and the relationship with customers. So ask this question around the world. Let's see if it works in Turkey. Who competes here? Company name you mean? Procter and Gamble? Yeah. Okay, Turkey's the first place in the world where someone hasn't said Apple. Because that's what they do. They create incredibly innovative products, but they've always created innovative products. They've not suddenly become an innovative product company. They transitioned once they actually put innovation and technology in a line with in a way that actually creates a relationship with that product with the customer. Whether or not they're still going to be on that path now Steve Jobs has passed, I'm not so sure. But, you know, that's what they did. And then wherever I've been, whether it's been China or South Africa, everyone's always said Apple. So this it's foul. Then. So, 3M, yeah. But it's the ability to just have two words on a slide that articulates who you are and what you stand for and for everyone to get it. That translates into bottom line results. Because then you have to execute it through technology, through people, through everything that you do. So it's not just about putting words on a website. It's about actually living and breathing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, you know, things like organizational structures and networks and, and your business model should follow your strategy, not the other way around. So how do we break this down and then to our supply chain strategies? So Michael Porter, you know, it, some good quotes here. He's got plenty. Here's three I particularly like. You know, if you're trying to do the same thing as your rivals, then the chances are that you're not going to be very successful. Now, how many companies are trying to do exactly the same thing as their rivals? We're trying to be cheaper. We're trying to drive out operational costs. We're trying to blah, 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 blah. You're trying to fight for exactly the same slice of the pie in exactly the same way. Strategy 101 is all about choices. You can't be all things to all people. And this is about understanding that you have different customers who value different things, and the way they want to be delivered to may be different. So try to have one set of supply chain processes, one supply chain model, and apply that to your entire business. It's basically saying all my customers are the same. All my customers have the same level of priority. All my processes are the same. They're the same. We have one size fits all. Yeah. And finally, you know, the company without a strategy is willing to try anything. So like my example earlier, hey, let's try same-day delivery. Let's give it a go. You know, that's an expensive way to try and do business. So different customers want different things. First thing, would you agree that you have more than one supply chain in your business? I'm looking for a yes. <laughs> You have multiple supply chains in your organization. So first thing, you've got to understand that. If you don't understand that, then the rest is kind of irrelevant. You have multiple supply chains in your business. Each supply chain contains a mix of products and services. Each supply chain serves different customers. Different customers value different things. Would you agree? Yes. Get the hang of it now. <laughs> different customers bring different levels of value. 
Would you agree? Yeah, so sometimes we focus on the big customers because it brings volume. Maybe it doesn't bring a lot of profit. And we, just, we maybe, especially in consumer product goods, they're fast moving consumer goods, you know, ah, the independence, let's, let's, you know, we're moving it to Tesco's, to Carrefour. And actually, if you broke it down, you probably find you're not making much money out of those guys. You're not a volume, maybe you're getting some brand exposure, but you may be sacrificing customers that you make quite a bit of profit. And there's a great book by a guy called Jonathan Ellis Byrne from MIT, and he wrote a book called Islands of Profit on the Sea of Red Ink, and I, I do a lot of work around this. Uh, you know, by any measure, 30 to 40 percent of any business is unprofitable. But it's hidden by the 10 to 30 percent of the business that's extremely profitable. And because we average everything, on average, sounds like we're doing okay. But if we did more of the things that drive great profitability and less of the things that destroy profitability, we won't be doing okay. We'd be doing fantastic. But if we don't know what they are, and we don't treat everyone exactly the same, we're never going to find that out. You can't control what you don't understand. So, understand what customers you want and what they value most, and then design the end-to-end -end value chain specifically to deliver that value. And there's a... Peter Drucker once said, there is only one real definition of a business, and that is to create and retain a customer, because he's the only person who brings employment, or she. Now, let's take an example. Segmentation. Coca-Cola. Diet Coke. I like Diet Coke. I'm a brand whore. And it's a product that I'm prepared to pay extremely different prices for depending on where I am and what I'm doing. Yet at the base, it's exactly the same product. So if I look at this particular chart, regardless of whether or not I'm sitting in a top restaurant or whether I'm down at my local convenience store, the price I pay may differ between, and uh, this is in um, Sterling, you know, might be up to 25, sorry, what's the time? 28 times more expensive per unit but I don't feel like I haven't received value because my perception of value changes based on the environment and the situation I find myself in. So suddenly, when you can target your value chain to where you make most profit, you actually might design a different value chain to deliver that. So maybe more working capital to ensure that we never out of stock where we're making 28 times the profit to the supply chains where maybe we're, we're making only you know, one pound per 1.75 litres. So what we do now is we map the supply chain. So we understand we've got different products, different customers, they form different supply chains. This is an example from a client I did some work with a couple of years back now. I've took the products out to hide who it is. But we mapped, you know, and we're very linear. We, you've got different distribution channels. That's, that's our supply chains, these are models. What this enables us to do is say, well, now what's the business goal? What's the strategy? And this, this company had a business strategy. We're going to double the size of our business in five years. We're going to go from 500 million to a billion pound turnover. Great. How are you going to do that? Um, didn't know. So what do you want the guy on the shop floor to do differently to enable this to happen? What do you do your managers? What do you want your directors to do differently? And the reality is, as we discussed this, they kind of did know. There were things that were coming into play. And what we were able to map was, what does your future business look like? And it looked like this, and we did this in an afternoon. And we can understand that they were going into new markets and moving into export. They were going into new product lines. They were going to reach out to new customers. They were setting up e-commerce channels. And then suddenly you realize, we've never exported anything before. We have no skills in that. We've talked about putting a warehouse in a foreign country. We've never done that before. We haven't got an e-commerce website set up yet. We've not really got the planning finished goods because well, this was a bake goods co bread company, so bake, ship, bake, ship. You know, we make the same thing every day. What are we making today? Bread. Great. Ship it. Suddenly they're moving into the snack market, long shelf lives. We have no experience in that. We have no, so suddenly all the requirements that they needed to enable them to move from that really simply 500 million pound business model to this much more complicated multiple value chain model there became apparent. The task then for was how do I move from that model to that model? But it became apparent, it became visible for the first time. And then for each one of those, you can say, well, how best do we serve the customers in that value chain? What do they want? And it's a balance between you know, serving the customers and the cost to serve. So how best do I serve the needs of those customers? And how do I optimize, not minimize or reduce, optimize the cost to serve? 
Because if you're talking about things like reliability as being a key differentiator, where you ensure that you're the company that always has the stock on the shelf, then it might be worthwhile you know, paying a little bit more for product to have reliable suppliers, having a little bit more buffer of stock in your supply chain to make sure that you never drop a case of product because your customer values that over everything else, rather than just saying, our target is to cut costs. And if we lose a few shipments, we lose a few shipments. Because now you're really understanding what's important to the customer. And in other supply chains, it might be low cost. It might be just bring the minimum and unit cost down as low as possible. But you're able to differentiate now. So we have three supply chains in this little basic example here. A make to stock example, a make to order, and an engineer to order. And, and so the score model allows you to differentiate. So now you can start to say, well, where do I want to be superior? Where do we want to be better than everybody else? Where will we win? By delivering more value to the customers than everyone else. Where do we want to be better than everyone but not necessarily the best? Where do we want to give our advantage? And where are we happy to just be as good as everyone else? Parity. And this is all about what Michael Porter called trade-offs. Understand the trade-offs. And with every business I go through, when I start off to talk about cost, when they do this exercise, cost never really appears as being the superior factor because it's not customer-centric. And then once you understand that, you can start to do things like understanding your risks that impact your ability to deliver that value because it might be risks with reliability in this supply chain, or it might be risks with cost in this supply chain, or it might be risk with responsiveness. So when people talk about you need more resilient supply chains, you need more responsive supply chains, you need the three A supply chains, I was like, what, in every case? Or do you, you, know, you need to focus the supply chain to be targeted to what the customer values most and is prepared to pay for. And then the score provides you the ability to measure that. So if reliability has one metric, which is perfect order fulfillment, on time, in full, perfect quality, perfect documentation. It's a tough measure because it doesn't just say we shipped it. It means we also didn't get any returns. Nothing was damaged in transit. They had all the right documents, including the invoice. You know, we didn't get any credit notes at the end of it. You know, it's, a, it's a tough metric. Cycle time, from order capture to order delivery. You know, agility from everything from value at risk all the way to our ability to deviate, you know, handle deviations in demand and supply. Cash to cash cycle time. Our ability, you know, order books don't kill businesses. Cash flow kills businesses. The ability to turn cash. You know, we're taking loads and loads of orders, but we're out of money. You know, especially in the credit crunch world, it's not good. Or the return on working capital. So now for each supply chain, you're able to put the right measures in place and therefore give the right instructions. And the thing is, these add up. So you move the dials on these, and you start moving the dials on your balance sheet. What we're able to do then is, because we know for each supply chain, we're able to me measure your own business and find out where you are against those metrics. You then say where you want to be superior advantage parity. The score mark allows you to benchmark it. And that enables you to identify the gap between your current level of performance and the performance you actually need to have, depending on whether or not you want to be you know, superior, advantage, or parity in that market. And then the question is, how do we close the gaps? But now we have some numbers, which we can translate into financial figures, which actually allows us to have a business case that says, these are the outcomes we expect by closing these gaps. So when we start to talk about implementing supply chain improvement projects, we've now got something tangible to measure against. And because we've got these new top line metrics, now if we want reliability in our value chain, so we want a reliable value chain, we can measure it on perfect order fulfillment, we're able then to break it down. And say, so, well actually that means we need reliable planning, we need reliable sourcing, we need reliable manufacture, we need reliable delivery. So suddenly we need a culture of reliability in this value chain. We need reliable systems, we need reliable data. So try and create this cultural attribute. How can I contribute to reliability? And if we find out, for example, that we're falling in our metric of perfect order fulfillment, we can then deep dive. And it may be that we find it's in the procurement area, as an example. And then it, we can analyse and say, well, is that because are we getting overdue purchase orders by vendor or by buyer or by material? Which enables us to then deep dive in further to say, well, we can analyse now and do root cause analysis. Is it a supplier performance issue because they're constantly the same supplier? Is it a process conformance issue because it seems to be the same buyer over and over again? 
or actually is it a data conformance issue? So maybe we've got the material master set up incorrectly. We've got the wrong lead times on there. And therefore, we have the right actions that we undertake because we're actually addressing the root cause of the issue. But as an integrated supply chain, so we work in supply chain teams to actually understand, you know, this is where the issue is. This is the supplier. Let's work with him. How can we collaborate? Well, you know, he has no money. Maybe, maybe we invest in that supplier. We put barcode scanners in there to try and create an improvement in reliability because although we're investing a small amount of money, in the long term, our supply chain works better. So we can start to add all this up. So under the M4SC model, you know, we have now the ability to take you know, business plan analysis down into segmentation, groupings, prioritization, SWOT analysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the tools that are in there. And I've got a 10-minute warning, so I can't really go through it. <laughs> now we're able to understand what the customer values and we understand what our strategy is and we kind of understand what our metrics are. Now we can build the right network to support that. So rather than saying we need to you know, design a new supply chain network, to achieve what? Better reliability, better speed, better agility. Now we've, we're able to design the structure to support the strategy. So our customer value, for, you know, we can, our push-pull points in our supply chain now can be designed around what the customer values. So we've got long lead times. We might not want to store any stock at all. We want to, because actually, you know, it's all about working directly with suppliers, getting to do direct deliveries. We can take the cost completely out of the supply chain. Or do we need to make sure we've always got stock right on the shelf and it's going to be very, very responsive. So it's very much a push model and then just pull at the last point. So here's an example of a client I worked with um, last year. Um, plumbing business, you know, they had stock everywhere. They treat every customer the same. So there was about 50 million pounds worth of stock in the central warehouse, but never 50 million in the regional warehouses, and never 50 million in every store. And they, every customer was a customer. Every sale was a sale. And this was the guy actually who said, same day delivery. That's what we need. So what we did was we changed the network to meet the supply chains. So our traditional branch customers who wanted certain products to make sure they could solve today's plumbing issues, we made sure that those segment of products were always in stock. Generation Y, the customers they weren't serving, you know, we, we delivered the next day. And then our large contract customers came straight from central storage. So they, they had the right network model to support the right strategy. The benefits were availability went through the roof, costs went down, so we started to operate at a lower cost than when they were focusing on cost because we had the right strategy and the right structure to support that strategy. So when we can link the, what the score and then 4 sc can do, and I'm doing this quickly, I apologise, is you know, it's able to help you design, work on the strategy, look at the configuration of your network, look at the goals, translate those down to a functional network design, you understand accountabilities and responsibilities that need to be in that design and create a standard process. Processes, it's not a case of individual processes, it's not a case of this. It's about how well do the processes work together. So SCORE is all about the end-to-end -end supply chain, so from the customer's customer to the supplier's supplier. Okay, every link in the chain is important. Yeah. Every weak link puts the whole chain at risk. And it's talking about not just product flow, but also information flow and financial flows and understand how they flow for your business. So an example from pharmaceutical industries could look a little bit like this, from everything from the you know, materials all the way through to the, the asthma patient at the end there. Score, D core, C core brings them together so you can look at everything from design chain all the way through to consumer chain. And as you can see, the language is very similar, the structure is very similar, so it follows a similar sort of process. What SCORE does is it takes it down to the first three levels as a, as a standard. So you can very, very rapidly, like in the same day, map out down to you know, this sort of receive product level. And then underneath that, you will have your own systems. You might do it on an Excel spreadsheet. You might do it on SAP. You might do it with different people. That's where it gets configured to your, your requirement. What I find over time is that actually, when we look at the as-is models, Sometimes we don't need to go, why spend a lot of time deep diving what we do right now when actually we really need to be focusing on how we should do things moving forwards now that we can understand what our strategy should be for that particular supply chain. And the key to this is to do this, really. Once you understand what the strategy is and you understand who the customers you value are and you understand what they value, then you can focus your efforts on maximizing the processes that deliver that value. And optimizing the efficiency 
of those processes that enable the creation of that value and get rid of the stuff that just doesn't. But if you don't know what they are, you can't control what you don't understand. If you don't know what they are, then you end up just trying to optimize everything. So from a process perspective, SCORE M4SC allows you to validate your current processes, allows you to, again to work out the roles and responsibilities, your accountabilities, the company standard processes, and again, look, do some sort of maturity assessment. Where are we compared to the best practices? Where are we compared to our competitors so we can understand what the opportunity is? And finally, resources. So we want to move from these I-shaped people to this T-shaped people you may have heard of, where we don't just understand our own function and how to deliver that to excellence, but we actually understand the customer, what they value, all the way through to our suppliers and our role in the delivery of that chain so that we have the, these company full of T-shaped people who work together, who kind of link their arms, and we work together for the profitability and effectiveness of the value chain, not just the performance of the function. So when you start to join these T-shaped people together, and we have customers who say, hey, we value reliable supply, they go, that's good, because we focus on having reliable data that enables us to have reliable procurement, reliable suppliers, reliable manufacturing, reliable delivery, and confidently promote the fact that we are reliable. Because we understand what you value, and we deliver it. SCORE, therefore, enables us to link together all the different elements of skills, capabilities, training needed to promote people in those particular roles. So if we're talking about demand planning or we're talking about procurement, it's a, these are the skills that these people should have. So you can then do an assessment of your business and go, maybe one of the issues when we did the root cause is that it's a people problem. We can train, we can develop, we can incentivize the people, we can do an assessment to find out, you know, why do we get better performance over there than we get over here? And it could well be you know, skills and capabilities. When you talk about that, though, we go, what skills, what capabilities, a score kind of helps you for that. So in summary, the, from the resources side, we allow you to analyze resource requirements, do a skills assessment, standard operation procedures, technology needs, resources, and then therefore redesign and plan based on that. <laughs> I'm getting the, just get off stage quickly, <laughs> message. Um, organizational reliance and program resource planning. So you can, it helps you to sort of decide what is it we need, what technology do we need, what skills do we need, and do we have it? Where are our gaps? So when we join it up, as you can see, you know, the score can help you at multiple stages along that process by being able to do these things, by linking value chain segmentation, competitive drivers, by having the right metrics, by designing the right network to deliver that value, by strategically designing your Network from your push, your pull measures, your processes, your design and maturity assessments. Focus on effectiveness first, then efficiency. And finally, your skills and experience. And, and down here, we talk about performance control meetings, so bringing value chain teams together to be able to understand what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, look at supply and demand deviations every week, plan to actuals every month, and then every quarter look at strategic reviews. You know, are we delivering what the customer wants in the right way? What new opportunities exist? Why do this? I've got a different slide down there to that one. <laughs> because the value is enormous. So as we see, everything was trading quite nicely here. We've got three different lines. The Standard and Poor's average, the Dow Jones average, and the Green line is those companies that were members of the Supply Chain Council and used the score model. Not a lot of difference. And then something happened around about 2008. <laughs> and these people thought, this supply chain thing, I think we should start to do this properly and take it seriously. Now look, the gap in financial performance between the companies that follow this and do it right and those that do not is growing ever wider. Supply chain is important, value chain is more so. Okay. I was going to, haven't got the time to go through this. A couple of examples of companies that do it really well, Zara, blah, 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 or maybe I'll show it to you later. <laughs> A couple of books that you might be interested in, Supply Chain Excellence by Peter Borstorff talks about how to use SCORE. I've got an article which is available for the delegates um, on Segment for Success that was published in the European Business Review. Um, I did a whole series for them. This one um, specifically talks about SCORE, talks about segmentation. You may be of interest. If anyone's interested, um, drop me a line and they'll be able to send it to you. Maybe the organisers could send that out as well. 